how did we allow the conditions for a situation like this to even occur? I want, I just got two more questions in a rock for you. Um, one's going to be about your time with the SAS, your mission with the SAS. But before that, Zarqawi, I have been fascinated by Zarqawi forever, even more fascinated, I think, by Zarqawi than by bin Laden. Again, young people watching this have probably have never heard that name for this very moment. What was it like being in Iraq when the hunt for Zarqawi was underway? Yeah, I, I have the benefit of, of having been there just a couple months before uh, they killed his ass. Um, you know, again, we went, we, we flipped the script of, hey, we're going to go and do these certain things. And then there's this insurgency and we've got to turn that around. And Zarqawi uh, is the face of that, right? So, you know, how do we go neutralize this guy? Um, it was, there was a sense of urgency around that. It was everything, everything was focused on him, especially the tier one units. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to say it other than, you know, people were pretty focused on killing him. They, they understand the impact that he was having on the battlefield and he had to be removed. If, uh, if we didn't cut the head off that snake, there was no way we were going to get anything done. Yeah. Um, and, and, Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you so off. So when they actually killed Zarqawi, um, there was a combat controller involved in that. Uh, a teammate of mine, who absolutely, in my opinion, one of the best combat controllers um, to have walked, at least in my career. Um, he just happened to be at the right place at the right time when they had a beat on Zarqawi. Um, they actually woke him up and said, hey, we need you to come see what's going on. And you know he was there watching what was happening, feeding information, going, okay, here's how we do this. Uh, feeding information to make sure that dude got swept. And uh, the, the night that they killed him was a good night. I, I love hearing that. I love, I love, absolutely love hearing that. And like you said, that if there was any dude who deserved what what was coming to him, it's a guy that, right. that cuts off the heads of innocent people and, and parades around. I mean, what an absolute piece of garbage. Uh, last question on Iraq before we get into some general CCT stuff. I know you did a mission with the British SAS, which we're also going to talk about a little bit more later here. And when we were talking about it, you kind of also discussed how the media just completely botched what you guys had done and it had essentially lied about the mission, which is not exactly shocking. Can you please tell us how you ended up attached to an SAS unit and how the media royally got the story wrong? Yeah, um, so th this was late in my career, um, and I was over there in a leader's capacity, not in an operator's capacity. I was I was actually running our uh, Joint Personnel Recovery uh, Center, and um, the general came out, and he says, hey, uh, he says, Mike, he actually calls me LA, LA is what most people know, he says, LA, uh, I need you to go down and work with the BRICS. I'm like, well, what's that mean? So he goes, well, I need you to go down and advise them, because we're, we're feeding them assets every night and they're, they're not using them. And we don't know if they don't know how to use them, if it's a cultural thing, is it a, an active decision that they don't want to use them? And, you know, uh, especially air assets are, they're a commodity. Like if somebody has them, that means somebody else doesn't have them. Um, so it's okay. Well, all, all the way through the pipeline that when, when you're trained, you're trained to go as if you're going to be doing the most difficult thing. Even though they were telling me to be an advisor, I was like, and I, you know, remember I just left the schoolhouse a handful of years prior. So I'm still in my mode of, okay, I can't just go down there thinking I'm an advisor. I got to go down and prepare. So I spend the next couple hours programming my radios, getting an intel brief, uh, plugging in all the pertinent information in my GPS to make sure that I'm capable of, you know, at least surviving. I, I get off the helicopter and I'm walking to their ops center. I've never met these guys, never met one of them. And dude meets me at the door. He goes, "Hey, that's your seat." He points to Humvee. I said, well, I, "I was told I'm coming down here to advise you guys." He goes, "No, we're going on a fucking mission in four hours. That's your seat." Roger that. So we walk in the building. I make sure I get up to speed on the mission we're going on. Make sure everything I've loaded in my radios is copacetic, uh, and then we roll out on this mission. You know, and that night we end up we're we're in what I think is one of the most difficult environments to be in. We're, we're actually in the inner city, um, and everything is a danger area. Every window you walk by, every alley, everything in front of you, like all it takes is one gun to point out of one of those and, and you're, you're shot. So, you know, hyper alert, going on this mission. 
Uh, we end up, we do a vehicle drop off a couple of clicks away and then we walk to our target. Uh, we go and hit the target and everything's going well. One dude squirts out the roof and he's hopping from roof to roof because in Iraq in the summer, a lot of them sleep on the roof because it's cooler. Um, which means they, they can navigate the roofs almost like they can navigate alleyways. Uh, and the Brits, are, you know, they're trying to track them. So I call up, we have an F-15 above us. And I go, hey, man, we got a squirter. Here's who's going. And the F-15 quickly gets beat on him. And he's feeding me information. And I'm now feeding uh, the Brits. Uh, and then eventually they track the dude down and, and capture him. Um, so it, it was a success in the sense that, you know, I got there. We did a mission. On that mission, you know, we have a squirter. We're able to use air assets to orient us to where he is. And then we we, we capture the dude. Uh, and take him back to wherever we took him to. Um, and I spent the next 10 days with him, and I, I did 10 days of missions with him. Um, and while we're doing this, I'm calling back higher headquarters going, hey, I can keep doing this because it's a lot of fun, but you probably need to get a younger, more relevant guy out here. Um, you know, so eventually they sent me a, a younger guy from the States. I did a couple-day handover with him, trained him up, and then, you know, put the right guy on the mission. I, while I did okay, the younger guys were more capable than I was, way more capable. Now, I know that there was uh, the, the mission, I, I believe, a later day, maybe the fifth day, fifth time you go out with these guys. The media was not very honest about what had happened. Can you explain how that situation unfolded? Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we got notification we need to go after a bomb maker. This guy was uh, creating bombs that were, you know, for use for IEDs that were killing Americans. Uh, so that was the mission that we were going for. Um we we helicopter inserted as soon as we hit the ground, we started receiving fire. Um these folks were prepared for an assault. Uh it was a hardened target. So as the assaults were draining up, they were able to breach the outer wall, but they couldn't get to the building. They were receiving pretty heavy fire from inside the building. Uh the ground force commander looked at me and said, I want you to destroy that fucking building. I want everybody to dead. So Roger that. So I called up up to uh pair F 16 above me, uh Viper 91 and 92. And I oriented them to the target, got them uh, ready to come in. I, I told the ground force commander, I said, you got to move your people away from there. He said, well, I really want bombs now. I said, yeah, but you're inside of our collateral damage assessment area. Like these guys will get injured if I drop bombs right now. So they started pulling everybody back. By the time we got everybody back, I had the uh, Viper 9192 on short final waiting for clearance. Uh, right then I had Hammer 71 uh, sign on. Hammer 71 was a uh, AC 130, uh, which is a more surgical platform. So I gave the Viper flight abort, abort, abort. Uh, I could feel the anxiety in their voice. Like they wanted to engage this target. So they were kind of pissed off, but I, you know, I boarded them, sent them up to 10,000 feet and asked them to hold there. And then uh, caught the AC-130 on. And AC-130 did as advertised. Like they're so surgical and they're so good at what they do. Uh, they were destroying the building. Nothing around it was getting destroyed. We were getting secondary explosions from the bomb makers uh, workshop. Um, and, you know, they, they killed everybody on target. Um, we walked up and did an assessment to make sure everything, you know, did what it was supposed to do. And then we we flew home. Uh, when we got back, the general came out. He said, hey, Mike, I'm concerned. Uh, in the news, they're saying you guys had these people on their knees and you put bullets in the back of their heads. Um, I said, well, that absolutely didn't happen. Um, you know, we had video of, of what we did from helicopters and from the aircraft. Um, I said, so we can validate what we did. And, and he took took our word for it. General was a pretty awesome guy. He he believed his troops and and listened to what people had to say. Plus, we had the video evidence. Um, but, you know, your question speaks to the nature of warfare. And the fact is, is uh, the media has a role. They're quick to publish stuff because they got to beat their competitors. A lot of times they publish inaccurate stuff and the enemy feeds on that. And they, uh, I can't tell you the amount of guys I know who are in firefights that if you believe the media, they attacked a wedding party and killed a bunch of people celebrating a wedding. Um, and they were only shooting their weapons in the air because they were celebrating. Uh, but the fact is they weren't. These were ambushes that guys were in and they were saving their own lives and their team's lives. So uh, it's, it's a dynamic in the battlefield that we absolutely have to play in every day. I, I, let me tell you a quick story to play off that that I think will drive the point home and back up your version of the media. About two years ago, I interviewed three Delta operators that were part of the same unit. Like, it's not, they're all in the unit at the same time. They're on the exact same tiny assault force. And they shot four people that were disguised as Afghan police officers in a vehicle who were on their way to go kill someone. And one of them was either the nephew or the cousin of like the regional, regional leader of Afghanistan. And the media reported 
U.S. forces murder four Afghan police officers. They weren't cops. They were all bad guys. They were going to, but it didn't matter. The truth was out there. Now their, their command, they said, back them up. They knew they'd killed the right guys. But once that narrative gets out there, it, it's, it's out there. Right. And it's hard to reel that back in. Well, we're seeing it play out in, in Israel right now. Right. I mean, it's, um, you go down to Gaza or the West bank. That's that, you know, the media reports what they receive as fast as they can. And they vet it as much as they may want to. Um, the best decision I saw throughout my entire career was when I was with the Brits in Iraq. Uh, we came, as a matter of fact, the night we came off that target I was talking about, um, it was in the morning, so sun's coming up. We landed at the, the base, the forward operating base, and Intel meets us at the, at the um, vehicles and says, hey, we got to beat on Zarqawi. We want you to go get Zarqawi right now. And uh, had I been with some of the other forces I've worked with, they had to turn around, got on a helicopter and run after him without even thinking about it. And the Brits went, we want to do some mission analysis. And we went back to the uh, op center. We went to a room. The officers actually said, hey, enlisted guys, go do your thing. And I watched the enlisted SAS guys go through the decision-making process. They laid out all the facts and assumptions and to include the condition of us. Like we had just go, we've been doing back-to-back -back missions every night not getting a whole lot of sleep, and we're coming off a target. They want us to go faster up into a hardened target after the sun came up. And the, the guys went, first off, we don't believe your intel is completely accurate. If it is, he won't move because he doesn't move during the day, so he'll be there. We'll go get four or five hours of sleep. We'll wake up, and then we'll, we'll go into mission planning, but we're not going right now. Uh, and the officers backed him up on it. And I remember just sitting there in awe going, this was the best decision I've ever seen made. Not only was the decision good, but how they got to it was really good. Um, so I have a strong affinity for the British SAS because I spent 10 days with them and I watched them make a decision that I know for a fact other forces would have gone, we'd have gotten a helicopter shot out of the sky for no reason because we'd have gone in the daytime. He wouldn't have been there. It's still a hardened target. And um, you know, when you faster about the helicopter in the morning, when people are just waking up, you're nothing but a target. Um, I thought it was a great decision. So I have a strong affinity for the British SAS. Did they ever get a concrete answer whether or not he had been there when they thought he was? Yeah. yeah by the time we woke up, they're like, yeah, he's not there. And the enlisted guys were like, exactly. You know, so you either send us into something, but uh, dude, the Intel guys, they were like, you got to go do it now or we'll lose this opportunity. And uh, they just didn't allow the emotion of the moment to get in the way of making a good decision. Uh, it was, it was impressive.